Hi, my name is Johanna Pounds. Today I will be presenting on Matthew Lewis's The Monk and talking about how his paper relates to concept of sexuality and lust at the time that it was written. Matthew Lewis's The Monk is a novel about love, sinfulness, lust, death, and the devil. It's typical, it's gothic images playing into gothic tropes while also attempting to make those tropes its own. The typical gothic novel exploits its own tropes, often referred to as, quote, trappings, and according to Robert Hume of the Modern Language Association, quote, these gothic trappings include haunted castles, supernatural occurrences, sometimes with natural explanations, secret panels and stairways, time-yellowed manuscripts, and poorly lighted midnight scenes, end quote, that for a long time put the era under great scrutiny by literary scholars. The Gothic era, for far too long, was often called, quote, ridiculous, according to Hume, even when referencing its most popular authors, like Anne Radcliffe, despite her writing being considerably conservative compared to other authors during the Gothic era. The Monk can also be viewed as a typical Gothic novel, with secret plots, ghost marriages, and hidden passages in abbeys. While playing into these ridiculous plot lines, Lewis explores the concept of sexuality and lust. Male and female characters in the Gothic period play two very different roles, and according to Asmat Nabi from the Journal of Humanities and Social Sciences, there are two main roles in Gothic literature. Quote, the predator and the victim. The first is dangerous yet powerfully attractive. She helps portray the pain-pleasure paradox that has come to be synonymous with Gothic literature. The latter is fragile and vulnerable, end quote. These stereotypes are in, is in what is known the female Gothic. The other side of that, considered, quote, the male Gothic, which Lewis's novel fits under, is considered the superior gothic, where playing into tropes with no explanation is expected and, quote, rape is shown more directly than in the female gothic, end quote, said Nobby. Specifically, Lewis uses his female characters to portray these stereotypes within male gothic, while also attempting to turn those stereotypes on their head and have the women in the novel take back the power dynamic. In all Gothic novels, sinfulness has consequences, but Lewis exaggerates this idea. In The Monk, Lust specifically draws out consequences, and that Lust, and also Satan himself, consumes main characters. Lewis purposely exaggerated stereotypes to make his book overindulgent, knowing the expectations readers had at the time when reading a novel like this. Lewis was begged by his father several times to rewrite this novel, as the overindulgence of sexuality shook him. And Lewis did this. Lewis's father was not the only person who felt this way about his novel, as it was both widely criticized and widely praised at the time that it was written. Despite rewriting his novel several times to make it more and more censored, Lewis was still incredibly proud of his work, and for most of his life went as Matthew Monk Lewis. As a member of Parliament and the Haug, Lewis understood the atmosphere and opinions surrounding sexuality and lust at the time. The Monk is a social commentary on the discussion of sexuality and is a parody of this discourse. Lewis starts his novel in a church scene where our main character, Ambrosio, is performing a sermon. This first scene is important to how Ambrosio's character develops throughout the rest of the novel. His character is immediately addressed as pure. Quote, he is now 30 years old, every hour of which period has been passed in study, total seclusion from the world, and mortification of the flesh. His knowledge is said to be the most profound, his eloquence the most persuasive. In the whole course of his life, he has never been known to transgress a single rule of his order. The smallest stain is not to be discovered upon his character, and he is reported to be so strict an observer of chastity that he knows not in what consists the difference of a man and a woman. The common people, therefore, esteem him a saint. End quote. His physical appearance is also something Lewis's focuses on. Maybe to add another level of depth to Ambrosio's developing character, he said his nature was lofty and his features uncommonly handsome. His nose was alkaline, his eyes large, black, and sparkling, and his dark brows almost joined. His complexion was of a deep but clear brown. Study and watching had entirely deprived his cheek of color. End quote. And that, quote, few could sustain the glance of his eye at once fiery and penetrating, end quote. Ambrosio is also described as a gift from the Virgin. Although described early on as morally superior and pure, like just shown, Ambrosio loses his purity to a woman. The righteously pious man loses everything, surprisingly easily, at the beginning of the book. He will blame his downfall on a woman who is disguised as a man who tried successfully to seduce him by faking her own death. Rosario, 
The name Rosario is how this woman is introduced to us first. Rosario was an assistant of Ambrosio, thought to be a man who had seemingly an inappropriate relationship with Ambrosio straight out of the gate. Ambrosio looks at Rosario as a pseudo father figure as Rosario, Rosario was brought to the monastery at a very young age. However, though Rosario was at the monastery nearly his whole life, it seems, no one had ever seemingly looked upon his face or even held much of a conversation with him except for Ambrosio. They favored each other. Quote, in the abbot society, his heart seemed at ease, and an air of gaiety pervaded his whole manners of discourse. Ambrosio, on his side, did not feel less attracted towards the youth. With him alone did he lay aside his habitual severity. And Ambrosio, several times, even called being lonely without Rosario's presence. It is then revealed that, huge plot twist, Rosario is a woman in disguise. Her name is Matilda, and had been in love with Ambrosio since before they had met. She was so in love with him, in fact, she disguised herself as a boy and joined the monastery just to be near him, nothing further. Despite some inner conflict, and some outer conflict, because he gets bitten by a snake, but we'll get into that, Ambrosio did not report Matilda's lie to the monastery. Matilda is a powerful female figure that uses typical ideals of a woman and turns him into something unexpected. After Matilda reveals her secret to Ambrosio, he flees to his bedchamber to gather his thoughts and doubts. It is here we see an incredibly explicit scene between Ambrosio and his painting of the Virgin Mary on his wall. To Ambrosio, this painting is nothing short of perfect. It is the most beautiful and pure image he has ever seen. To say he has romantic feelings for this painting is an understatement. He describes dreams he would often have of the young Madonna, where she would embrace him with a kiss and a great warmth and look at her painting the next morning and feel embarrassed. Although a much different description from what defined Ambrosio's purity, her purity is based solely in her physical appearance. Quote, how graceful is the turn of that head? What sweetness, yet what majesty in her divine eyes? How softly her cheek reclines upon her hand. Can the rose vie with the blush of that cheek? Can the lily rival the whiteness of that hand? Oh, if such a creature existed and existed but for me, were I permitted to twine round my fingers the golden ringlets and press with my lips the treasures of that snowy bosom. These descriptions are another gothic trope that Lewis is purposely playing into. According to Nobby, the repetitive use of colors white and red, like the rose, also helps to reinforce the gothic paradox, white typically being associated with innocence and purity, red with wrath and passion. In Atenea, Vartal Messier said, equally disturbing is the disclosure, quote, equally disturbing is the disclosure of Ambrosio's sexuality as he fantasizes about both Matilda and the Virgin Mary, end quote. Lewis purposely uses the image of the Virgin Mary to shake his audience as he know her, knows her purity is in high regard and this sort of language would shock people reading, leaving room for true horror and awe. He also used this image as a symbol because at the time, the idea of the Virgin Mary was under great scrutiny as, according to Kill Herringer of the Manchester University Press, Mina believed that Mary was not pure after getting pregnant with Jesus and therefore all babies were not birth worthy of baptism because to be born, whether you were born in a marriage or not, you must be a product of sin and lust. It was actually not until 1856, long after the monk's publication, that Pope Pius IX, quote, declared that Virgin Mary had been preserved from original sin in anticipation of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, end quote. Therefore, she uniquely was born without original sin, and that purity was never violated even after her death. The idea of violating purity moves into the next scene when we see Ambrosio... Um, meet and Tilda, Matilda in the next day in the garden where her secret was revealed previously and asked her to politely leave the monastery for his own sanity. She put up a fight but eventually agreed if he only picked a flower for her to keep at his chest to remember her by. He agrees, but when he bends down to pick a rose, he is bitten by a poisonous snake. The flower is often thought to represent virginity and innocence, and this scene represents the innocence within Ambrosio being disrupted for the first time. The imagery of a rose in correlation with innocence was even seen when he was previously describing his, virgin, his image of the Virgin Madonna and her cheek. He was rushed to the surgeon among the monks promptly, who told everyone he had only three days to live. Ambrosio did live, and everyone was convinced he was a saint. Matilda soon appears at his bedside and plays him a song. She talked of her sorrows as he pretended to sleep and addressed his picture of the Virgin Mary. Turns out, the image is based on her. She had allegedly gotten the painting commissioned by an Italian artist when she first discovered Ambrosio, and then had it sold by a partner of hers to him. 
She relishes in the fact that the painting of her is the only religious figure that he chooses to confide and pray to in his free time. She tells Ambrosio all of this because she's on her deathbed, having somehow taken the poison out of Ambrosio and putting it into herself. This is where we see Ambrosio fully give in to his sexual desires. As Matilda is on her deathbed, her final wish is basically that they would have sex. Ambrosio gives in to the temptation, falling at her breast, quote, drunk with desire, he pressed his lips to which those which sought him. His kisses vied with Matilda's in warmth and passion. He clasped her rapturously in his arms, forgot his vows, his sanctity, and his fame. He remembered nothing but the pleasure and opportunity, end quote. Once again, Lewis's use of Matilda as a repre representation of the Virgin is purposeful, as she is eventually revealed to be a pawn for the devil meant to seduce and bring down Ambrosio's purity specifically, she could be representative of Lewis's critique of monasticism. As Lewis was an important political figurehead at the time of this being published, he understood that there was a lot of religious tension surrounding the concept of monasticism, and most people thought negatively of the concept, and that according to Mark Canuel, in Studies of Romanticism, the, quote, dispute into which the Gothic novel entered can be considered most generally as a dispute over Britain's disestablishment, end quote. This was most likely Lewis's way of indulging in that idea and trying to further disrupt the establishment that was around at the time by making a figurehead that was already at such great debate like the Virgin Mary the villain in the novel. The concept of purity here is then double-sided. On one side, purity is something that Lewis thinks society is striving to be, like Ambrosio. Therefore, all the relevant female figures in his novel, purity is something based on looks and virginity. On the other side of the scoring, purity is something completely unachievable. It is not based on looks or virginity, but rather, according to Lewis, something completely based out of religion. Virginity is the lack of sinfulness, while sinfulness is something that comes out of monasticism. Purity is something achieved not through love or white skin, but something constructed by the church. Matthew Lewis and the monk not only refused that the idea of purity is flawed and that women cannot be held to the ridiculous standards put on them by monasticism, but that the gothic novel itself puts women in an undesirable light. In the monk, sinfulness is given due to a necessary religious standard, something that even the purest men and women cannot help but fall to. He also points out the tropes, that the tropes in gothic novels surrounding women give unfair credit to men, and that a man falling to lust and shin should be considered just as impure and sinful as a woman in these circumstances. This deviates from other gothic novels of the time. His novel not only mocks the typical gothic novel, but also uses the genre to create a socio-political book that is the definition of the genre itself. Thank you very much. Um, have a good day.